Hello and welcome to Worship with Brightwood Christian Church. It's a joy to have you with us today. And Pastor Jan and Quisenberry, our um, beautiful imagery today doesn't have a lot of deep symbolism. It's just beautiful pictures of fall. It speaks to me of God's loving creation. And so I hope that you enjoy that and, and take the time to pay attention to the fall as it unfolds before you, whatever that might look like. I hope that you'll engage fully in worship and Think of this as something that we're doing together, and I hope you'll visit us at brightwoodchurch.org where you can find other ways to grow your life of faith. We begin by calling ourselves to worship, and um, you will join me when you see all those parts are for both of us together. In the midst of war and division, we wait for God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. In the midst of devastation and loss, we wait for God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. In the midst of change and uncertainty, we wait for God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Let's sing together. Let the whole creation cry. If you have a chalice hymnal, it's number 21. And if you don't, that's okay, because the words are going to all be on your screen. Let the whole creation cry, Alleluia. Glory be to God on high, Alleluia. Sun and moon, lift up your voice, turn to a spirit of prayer with me. God of our salvation, we thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you for all those who've taught us the good news. Kindle in us always this gift, this good treasure, that we may live the life to which you've called us according to your purpose and your grace. We pray in the name of the one who abolished death and brought life to light through the gospel our Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. As we prepare ourselves to pray for God's people everywhere, I hope that you'll join me in singing, Open My Eyes That I May See. If you have that chalice hymnal, you can hear mine being turned in the background. It is number 586. I don't have my sort of post-COVID voice back, and so I, I feel a little better having the music in front of me right now. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Lace in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silent 
Quickly now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my ears that I may hear, voices of truth, thou soundest clear. And when the waves notes fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my ears, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love with thy children thus to share. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my heart and O oh God of grace and God of glory, you care for the whole earth. Even now you are reconciling all things to yourself. We thank you for the ancient grace given in Christ Jesus before the ages began. As age has succeeded age to this present day, your grace is still with us. We rely on your power for all things. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. We hope in you. We bring now before you the cares of the world. We pray for your people enduring the devastation of war and oppression from enemies. We pray for cities and for public life that has to suffer destruction and ruin. Bring restoration, we pray, and an end to conflicts that divide and destroy. Great is your faithfulness, O God. We hope in you. We pray for nations and peoples undergoing turmoil and struggle. Return us to your ways of justice and truth. Give us compassionate hearts and resolute spirits as we work to repair community and offer solace where there is no resting place now. Great is your faithfulness, O God. We hope in you. God of tender mercy, you hear the cries of the one who is suffering, of the one trying to recover, the one who's been hurt by another, of one risk at risk in a complex and impersonal system. Enfold each one in your steadfast love. Take special care of those who do not or cannot cry out, but wait quietly in hope. Give voice to those who should not wait quietly. Empower them with strength and support all around. The powerless one who suffers abuse, the person who's lonely with no one to help, the one who wanders homeless among us unnoticed. The one carrying an old burden, a silent grief, or an unvoiced fear. With the gift of life given in the soaring light of your gospel, abolish the daily death they bear. Great is your faithfulness, O God. We hope in you. We pray for your church, so in need of healing and reconciliation. Rekindle in us the sincere faith of Christ and make us willing and faithful servants in unmerited grace, in startling new mercy. You chose to call us not servants, but friends. You have opened us to a place at your table of grace. We would be good stewards of your grace and glad of the company you call us to keep around your table, which is larger than we have yet imagined. In gratitude for the bread and cup you share, we will honor you by sharing our bread with others by offering without reserve the cup you bless. Great is your faithfulness. O oh God, we hope in you. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As we prepare ourselves for partaking in communion, let's sing Bread of the World and Mercy Broken. Bread of the World in broken wine of the soul in mercy shed by whom the words of life were spoken and in whose death our sins are dead look on the heart by sorrow broken 
thy grace our souls are fed. As we prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper, I want to invite you, remind you that all who believe in Jesus are invited to his table, and it's his table even if it's your table today. No matter where you are and what's going on, it can still be his table. That's just the kind of word we have. And I want you to think about welcome. We've had some guests in this weekend. And the ways that we welcome people into our homes, the way we make them feel welcome in our homes is different for everyone. But whatever you can do as you look around you to take a moment to make yourself feel more welcome in your space, and to think about welcoming the Christ into your space. And then if you haven't already, pause and prepare the elements of communion. And because <clears throat> the world is very different and because you may have to worship at home today, that can be a lot of different things. It's okay. Jesus knows. And then when you come back, we'll hear the words of institution. So just pause if you need to. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave a prayer of thanksgiving for it, and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and gave a prayer of thanksgiving for it, gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Truly, I tell you, said Jesus, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Amen. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for this feast set before us out of love, out of welcome, out of the longing to be together. Help us to extend that love and welcome to all that we meet this week. Help us to be nurtured enough by this feast that we are confident that it's your welcome and love flowing through us, that we don't have to rely on our own power, our own wisdom, our own grace, but instead that we draw those directly from the source of all good things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture for today is Psalm 37, 1 through 9. Do not fret because of the wicked, and do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Amen. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Last week, we talked about the value of contentment. And I believe in being deeply satisfied with your life in most ways. But if God wanted everything in the world to stay the way it was, then the Bible wouldn't be so long. The scripture calls us into partnership with God for the transformation of the world in response to his love made flesh in Christ. So there must be some holy form of discontent that stirs our desire for the changes God wants. In the same way, there's righteous anger and unrighteous anger. So much of it is a matter of what kinds of things have caused the anger. We should be angry about injustice, oppression, war, hunger, and abuse. It shouldn't feel comfortable and be okay. But what do we do with that in the face of today's psalm and the rest of scripture? After all, the Bible mentions anger 
hundreds of times in a lot of different ways. We know the Bible says that God gets angry, although the scripture says he's slow getting there. He always uses the word kindled. You know, if you try to start a fire outside and you sort of have to coax a little bit, it takes a little time to grow. Exodus 4 talks about, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. We know that sometimes our biblical heroes who experience anger, all those big names in the Bible, almost all of them have the word anger sometimes associated with them or some sort of action that clearly means they've been angry and upset. Um, Moses, uh, we hear in verse in six, uh, Exodus 32, as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot and he threw the tablets from his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Sometimes God uses the anger of others as a tool for the punishment of Israel. The Lord aroused against Jehoram the anger of the Philistines and of the Arabs who are near the Ethiopians in 2 Chronicles. Sometimes we long to use the anger of God as a tool against our own enemies. I love that the, the Psalms sort of give us the freedom um, to express, we need to express to God and to feel like we're not going to really mess up and we can just share who we are with him. And sometimes that looks really angry. Psalm 7 verse 6 says, Rise up, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake, O my God. You have appointed a judgment. In the wisdom writings, we see warnings about anger coming too quickly. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 tells us to not be quick to anger, for anger lodges in the bosom of fools. And warnings about it lasting too long, we see in Ephesians 4, 26, be angry, but do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your anger. The strongest argument against anger comes from Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. You've heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. Whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you're angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. But don't we see Jesus angry? We always think about that moment of the turning over the tables of the money changers and, and salespeople in the midst of the temple. And that particular scripture, if we look close, it doesn't even talk about Jesus being angry. It looks angry, but it doesn't talk about the emotion that happens behind what he did. He just talks about why he did it. There are other scriptures that do describe Jesus as angry. We see one example in Matthew 3. Again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had a withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. Jesus gets angry about people's lack of compassion. Warnings against anger only happen about five times in the New Testament, but they're there and they can't be ignored. And there's probably a lot of other scriptures that are sort of anger adjacent that are related to anger. And we have today's Psalm to compound that commandment against anger. But what's great about it is that it also gives us some strategies. And that's what I wanna play with today. How do we deal with our anger? It happens, it comes up, why do we feel it? What's wrong with it? Are there ways to avoid it? What do we do with it when it comes? I don't think that we can just decide we're not gonna be angry anymore. And I love it when the Bible tells us not to do something, but that gives us a little bit of an explanation on how not to do it. So let's first acknowledge, I think, that we sort of love anger. We like to watch it on television. It adds so much drama. We love it when people get mad at each other. Even in our comedy, it's the things that are irritating to people that tend to get the laughs. I think about basically every Seinfeld bit there's ever been. There's, there's a, a anger and annoyance that's out of that. 
And it isn't obvious, but we must get something out of anger because we choose it as a response to the world with shocking frequency. The scripture sees how much we kind of love to be angry. Job 36, 13 says, the godless in heart cherish anger. Cherishing anger, surely not. I said to myself, surely I can't cherish anger. But then I read these words from Frederick Buechner. Of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. And then I got it. When I read that, I remembered that my anger is always going to make me feel righteous, whether I am or not. My anger makes me feel entitled to my judgment about others. My anger gives me an excuse to turn my energy outward on those who have wronged me instead of using it to look inward on the wrong I've done. But the Psalm's clear about why we should avoid anger. Verse 37, or uh, verse 8, I'm sorry, says, Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. It only leads to evil. The danger of anger then isn't what it is, but what it does. Buechner's great quote about how we feel and how we fuel our anger, how we feed on it, finishes this way. In many ways, it's a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. We see the danger of anger everywhere. Some of my favorite examples come from the animal kingdom. Did you know that a rattlesnake can get so angry it bites itself and that it can die that way? It's rare, but it happens. The National Geographic told a story once about a national park ranger in British Columbia who had two sets of huge antlers as wide as a man's reach, both locked together. Evidently, two bull moose began fighting and their antlers locked, and they couldn't get free, and they both died. Locked in that anger and hurting ourselves. Anger is energy, but it, it usually ends up blasting out at the wrong people. You're combusting with our own spirits, slowly eating us away over long periods of time. That deep resentment that can be such a damage to ourselves and our relationships. And that anger energy, it isn't very good at knowing when to quit. Maggie Scar wrote, getting angry can sometimes be like leaping into a wonderfully responsive sports car, gutting the motor, taking off at high speed, and then discovering the brakes are out of order. And we've seen this. Something small builds and spreads until it has a life of its own, totally unrelated to what started it. The wonderful devotional book, um, The Daily Bread, it's also now an app, so I encourage you to think about looking into that. It shared a story long ago of the spring of 1894, when the Baltimore Orioles came to Boston to play just a routine baseball game, but what happened that day ended up as anything but routine. The Orioles, John McGraw, got into a fight with the Boston third baseman and within minutes all the players from both teams had joined into the brawl. But the warfare quickly spread into the grandstands. Among the fans the conflict went from bad to worse. Someone set fire to the stands and the entire ballpark burned to the ground. Not only that but the fire spread to 107 other Boston buildings. It's not about the anger. It's about what the anger does. So, since it can lead to such evil, how do we avoid it? I think one clue is in the repeated use of the psalmist's word fret. Do not fret because of the wicked, it says. Do not fret over those who prosper in their own way, over those who carry out evil devices. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. 
Now, the dictionary definition of fretting is to be constantly or visibly worried or anxious. And that's the main definition. It's the one we're most familiar with. But there is another, a second one that's, I think, equally important here. To gradually wear away at something by rubbing or gnawing. It's used about anything erodes, that erodes, whether it's a, an animal or, or nature itself. A beaver fretting at a log or the stream fretting a channel into the ground. And those of you who worry may already know that feeling that you just can't let something go. You grab an idea and maybe a sort of it grabs you back and and you can't quite let it go, forget it, put it down. We do the same thing to anger. We take something that happens to us and we fret over it, turning it over and over in our brains, adding a little more anger from episodes of our past, a little of something of that we're ashamed of or embarrassed by, a little bit more from what we envy. And every time we look at it again, we just feel more justified in our anger. It just builds and builds. And so the psalmist repeatedly tells us to stop fretting. It's a reminder to lay it down. Lay it down. Don't pick it back up. I see you. Lay it down. That guy that just cut you off in traffic, lay it down. Lay it down. What do we do instead of fret? Verse 3 tells us, trust in the Lord and do good. See, within the scriptures on anger, the majority of them, many, hundreds probably, are about God's anger. Because it belongs to him. He's the only one that's powerful enough to wield it with any wisdom at all. And since it duly belongs to God, we've got to trust him that he will deal with it if it is really a problem. Starting in verse 5 of our psalm today, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. We got to trust that God saw that jerk cut us off in traffic too. We got to trust that if we are really in the right, that we have help on our side. There is such a thing as righteous anger. But when we go to the Lord first with our troubles, when, as verse 7 commands, we are still before the Lord and wait patiently for him, then he can sort of help us figure out what's worth being angry about and what isn't. For the stuff that isn't, when we're already in a prayerful frame of mind, God can help us have the peace to let it go or to forgive or to find the ways that we have been a part of the problem and work towards our good. And when there's a real injustice, in personal or business matters. We know it happens. It happens. But we can know that the one who is bigger than both sides of the problem is shining a light on it. That takes a lot of pressure off of us and allows us to lay it down so that we don't turn anger into wrong action. It's not that we don't do anything, but we can do what verse 3 tells us. Trust in the Lord and do good and do good. Then we're not reacting to those first moments of explosive emotion. We can act with wisdom. We can act in our best interest and in the interest of others. We can act in a loving way, which you really can do even in the face of wrongdoing. And it's powerful. The same is true for big injustices, world scarring injustices, powers and principalities is how the scripture puts it. God doesn't want us to turn away from suffering and oppression. Yes, we're called to turn the other cheek, but that doesn't mean we're not busy changing the world. And God doesn't want our anger to turn into evil, to create another injustice, another pain, another scar on someone else or in ourselves to make our situation worse. I think it's why nonviolent protest has been so powerful and effective over time. Because trusting in the Lord and doing good 
is how those things work. Then any anger that we have fuels both our prayer and our action, not for our own good, not for the sake of our own feeling righteous, not for our loud voices, not for our own fame, but for building the kingdom. Will you pray with me? Holy God, bless our hearts. We hear that phrase, bless your heart, in the South sometimes, and sometimes that, that phrase comes out of anger itself, but we know that our hearts need blessing. We know that our actions are so often driven by our emotions, but that our emotions aren't always given to us by you that our history and our hurts our fears and our longings can make us feel angry even when there isn't an injustice even when there's not something to be angry about the scripture says god that you are slow to anger help us to have anger at least at your pace to go slow. God, help us to trust in you and do good, to be still before you as our first response to those things that don't feel right. We thank you that you've given us a longing to have right in the world, but help us to trust your wisdom to decide what that is. Help us to take less pleasure in the anger of others and to encourage the enjoyment and delight of peace. Help us to find it in ourselves and to offer it to the world by trusting in you, doing good where we can and building your kingdom for all your people. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're going to close in singing out of the depths and this one is new to me i'll say this and sometimes i just get a little bit of a wild hair because i sort of fall in love with the sentiment of a scripture with or with of, of a hymn uh, with the words of a hymn even if it's not something that I would end up singing. So here we go with this one. Out of the depths, O oh God, we call to you. Wounds of the past remain, affecting all we do. Facing our lives, we need your love so community heal us by your touch out of the depths of fear oh god to we speak breaking the silence as the searing truth we seek Safe among friends, our grief and rage to share. Here in this community, hold us in your care. God of the loving heart, we praise your name. Dance through our lives and loves of Anoint the spirit flame. Your light illumines each familiar face. Here in this community, meet us with your grace. May the steadfast love of God be upon you. May the grace of Christ Jesus, our Lord, be within you. May the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit uphold you, now and forever. Amen.